Welcome back. Welcome to the TL901 from Scotch. No, not Scotch the drink. Scotch the brand. This is my little laminator. Isn't that sexy? Look at the things that we do on a Saturday night. Who said the Wargamers aren't awesome? Well, why I figured, you know, instead of wasting all of my time just watching the red light and waiting for it to go green, I'd actually do a quick little look at, wait for it, battle above the clouds. So, It's almost as good as watching paint dry. It's fantastic. I'll be right back and we'll do Battle Above the Clouds. So I gotta tell you, I'm kind of fascinated by this, uh, this TL901 thing. It, it looks, model numbering to me is really curious. What will the TL1000 be like? But that's a, comp that's a, that's a topic for another conversation. So let's have a look at Battle Above the Clouds. And I wanted to talk about this game because this is a game that uh, I think has helped reconcile in a small part my challenge with, uh, with the whole con uh, Confederate War, the American Civil War thing. And uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's caught in between, you know, it's post-Napoleonic, pre-World War I, the Crimean War is going on somewhere, I think around about the same time or part of the same time, and there's other things going on in Europe. But this, you know, look at this terrain, right? Look at the terrain there. You can see it's so different, and the fighting and the things that occurred were so, the battles that occurred in, were in terrain that is so different from the European theater. And it also was a, at a little nexus point with technology. We had rail and telegraph, and the um, ferries obviously were available in Europe at that time as well. But it seems that this is one of the first, at the campaign level, where the first times we saw, really saw the complete movement away from the classical strategy of line up and shoot each other and, and kill each other. There was a lot of core-sized and army-sized movements and lunges and counter-lunges and attacks and counter-attacks and all those sorts of things that went on at the campaign, the strategic or, or actually the operational level, that really drove uh, my interest for the period. And I know nothing, very little about the period. I've been to Gettysburg once, I've read bits of books, I've read the rules, the line of battle and a few other games and I've probably play the Avalon Hill Gettysburg game and I guess that doesn't really count as history too much. <coughs> but all the games I had purchased up until now had been the titles that were grand tactical in scale. And I think that was probably a mistake because really what is interesting in the American Civil War is the maneuver. It's the positioning and bringing forces to bear so that you can have that decisive blow. Uh, the true operational art of war concept. And it seems like the American military on both sides evolved that thinking here and then promptly forgot it when it came to World War I, which I found curious. So there is an interesting exploration to be had here. And I don't know if this particular series will do it for us, but it's something worth looking at. I am certainly not in the mood to try and dig up all nine or eleven titles, however many there are, but I am interested in playing campaign scale games of this particular system and linking together where possible and available and feasible uh, some larger scale conflicts so that we can really start to get a feel for what was going on and how it was working. And you may say, well, 
you're just going to play a game, so how can it be? How can it be all that, right? Well, there's a few things about this game after only a few turns with it that I particularly like and find particularly interesting. I, I think that uh, first of all, let's talk about the maps and the counters. You know, this artwork is fine. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism online about it. I don't mind it. I mean, they're just generic counters for whether it's cavalry or uh, artillery or whatever the case may be. They're just organizational units, right? Metrics. That goes from you know, units, uh, not units. Um, yes, units. And so, you know, you've got one cannon or one cav or one or two arty or whatever it may be, and it's with its leader. The leader is typically denoting what what's in the in the pack, right? I think that's how it works anyway. And you have this concept of fatigue. And fatigue is particularly important because as you accrue fatigue, it's going to change the cost on the terrain that you cross. Uh, it's going to cost you more to move. And combat is also a function of movement. And that means that when you're trying to bring forces together at a critical point, say this little, let's zoom in here a little bit, let's find a spot so that's somewhat mildly interesting. Here's Chattanooga. Uh, I'm just actually trying to find something that I've played on, that I know that I've played on. But it doesn't matter. Okay, let's just have a look at this here. And I'll try and zoom in a little bit on the Tennessee River. And we'll talk about that. So. The neat thing about this game is that you're rolling for... So first of all, you're choosing your commander and and who can he <coughs> activate, how many forces can he activate, depending on his ratings. And then you're rolling dice to see how many movement points he's going to have, plus or minus, depending on whether you're Union or Confederate. So you have to choose first so you're looking at all your formations and there will be several on a battlefield at any given time. You're choosing the formation and then while you're going through that exercise, you're thinking, okay, if I move this guy, I can do this, 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 and this. And if I move this guy, I can do this, 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 and this. And then you make a choice and you optimize your move and you go, I'm going to move these guys. And that's what you would typically do, right? But let's just say I've got a, a unit here and a unit here and I want to get to here to attack across the river. And I need to save, uh, I don't know how many movement points it is to attack, and it doesn't really matter. But let's just say, you know, I, I've got uh, forces that are able to be activated by the same leader for whatever reason, and I want to move them to here and then move them to here. Well, I declare that I want to use that formation, pop, uh, roll the dice, find out how many movement points I have, and I go, oh, hmm. All right, well, these guys can get to here, that's fine. But then these guys uh, maybe are not gonna make it because of the, well, uh, these guys can get here and these guys can't, for instance. And they're not gonna be able to make it. And, and here's one of the reasons why they won't be able to make it, because when you move a force into a hex, the more steps of strength you have in it, the more expensive it is to move in. Well, isn't that interesting? So you've gotta think through which unit you're gonna move into the hex, which unit you're gonna move into first, Will you have enough movement points based on the roll that you make, which is completely random? It's two dice or one die? Maybe it's two dice, I forget now. And you have to uh, then get here and then still have enough movement points left to attack. All the while, while you've done that, you've accrued uh, a step of fatigue. And once you get the three, there's not a whole lot you're doing. And every hex you move into costs you more to move into and is incrementally more expensive. Pretty fascinating. A combat system is wonderfully simple. Uh, you both go through and go through your odds calculations and uh, DRMs and modify column shifts for all the different factors here, whether they're flank attacks or flank attacks or bridges or ferries or whatever the case may be. It's very, very, very straightforward. And uh, then you both roll a die, and you roll uh, on the attacker's table and the defender's table. I'm sorry, here we go. And you get a result. And that's it, and you're done. So it's a movement game first, and a combat game second. But 
I think what I've seen so far is the combination of fatigue and uh, disruptions and kills will grind away your armies until such time as you have time to recover overnight or at a given at end of turn, whatever it may be, and then recoup that fatigue. And fatigue recovers very quickly. I think it's three, three points you'll pick back up uh, for every rest period, which may be an end of a turn, I believe. So if you can imagine two maps laid out, <clears throat> a couple of dozen group army groups roll, 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 rolling around the map, and you're all trying to maneuver and outmaneuver each other to get to some situation where you, you have a, a critical mass of force that despite fatigue, despite the cost of move into the hexes, you've overwhelmed your enemy and destroyed them. That sounds freaking awesome to me. So what's the downside with this system? The downside, I think for me particularly, and you may not have an issue with it, is going to be these things. These displays are uh, similar to the concept uh, with Washington's Crossing that drove me mad, except these are, uh, you can organize the way they're structured here a little bit more because I can denote who force one is and uh, it's not an, an alphabetical list or a non-alphabetized list as the case with Washington's Crossing. Uh, so have these force pools to keep the, the hex stacking density down and all that sort of stuff. Because you want to put the unit here, the fatigue on that unit, any other special situation that uh, unit may be in. And you grab one of these little force counters. Let's see if I can find it. I don't know if they're here somewhere. Where are they? Sorry, and the advanced game, oh, here we go, here's the rest of them. And the advanced game also has uh, supply considerations and stuff in it as well. So these, these little tokens here uh, are gonna go onto the map. Now, I gotta say that I, I've spent a lot of time looking backwards and forwards, and I'm not sure I like that unless everything is laid out correctly. And I'm sorry, this is gonna be a long video, I guess, because I've got a few things to say still. So, <clears throat> You've got to deal with the wagon trains, you've got to deal with... So let's talk about these four things. So you've got to move backwards and forwards looking over, okay, what's force four got in? Okay, it's got 10 guys, so I want, maybe want to move that guy first. Well, I don't want to move that guy first? Hmm. Well, he's also allied or uh, under the same command of this guy, so maybe I want to move both those guys. How many factors has he got? Should he go first or he go first? And I'm going to be going backwards and forwards to the map. How much nicer would it have been on a two-map system and... I know that this, this system spans a couple of decades, so we can't go back and change all the maps. But wouldn't it have been lovely to have a slightly larger hex, and you know, larger maps, that's fine, or more maps. Uh, we're on a, once you get to two maps, it doesn't really matter, right? You may as well have, if you're gonna have two, you may as well have three. Uh, and, and just give us a little more room in each hex, such that we can, manage the stacks a little bit better and, and really not have to deal with this at all. I, I, uh, or come up with some other way of doing it. I'd almost rather use a piece of paper than, than have to deal with this. Uh, I ended up, I found myself when I was playing with my buddy, he kept all his stuff on the force chart. I found myself keeping all my units on the map because that helps me visualize what's going on. <clears throat> now there is some element to a fog of war there too, right? So if, uh, if you've got this this chart set aside and you can't see it, the enemy can't see it, and you've got it stacked up or something like that, I guess, uh, then maybe there's a little fog of war element there that might be kind of cool. So anyway, lots going on in this game. It is a fairly robust rule book. Uh, these are all the scenarios, I think. Oh no, this is the basic rules. So, um, Really interesting game. I've enjoyed the very limited amount of it that I've played. This is a well-produced game. There's not a whole lot of errata. That's what I was printing off and sealing in, uh, sealing in these little laminated things. So I'm looking forward to getting my teeth into this. A buddy of mine owns all of the games, and so we're going to try and get through some of them uh, over time. 
<coughs> I want to share that with you just because I think it's an interesting game system. And you can find this online if you hunt carefully. I managed to pick this up for about $45 or $47 plus $9 or $10 for shipping. I felt like that was a fair price for it. And, and it's unpunched as well. I didn't realize it was unpunched. I could have sworn it said punched on the title. So there you go. Talk to you soon. Uh, have a look. Well, there will, uh, before I roll away, <laughs> uh, there will be a fairly extensive set of videos on this at some point. But it probably won't be this year. Later.